Starting off the news this week, a paper published in the Astrophysical Journal has further analysed data from the James Webb Space Telescope on Irandel, the most distant star known. Irandel was discovered back in March by the Hubble Telescope, taking advantage of a gravitational lens, and can now be studied by the much more powerful James Webb Space Telescope. It has been concluded that Irandel is likely a B-type giant star, also suggesting that it could be a luminous blue variable star. Both of these star types are particularly luminous stars, perhaps unsurprisingly given we can see it from such a distance. Even with the JWST, we still need to take advantage of the gravitational lens. Irandel really is a colossal distance away, and a lot of the specifications that have come out of this paper about this star are wildly ranged estimates. The idea that the star could actually be a binary system is also still considered a possibility. Despite the uncertainty, it's really cool to see this discovery studied further with the new tech we now have available with the JWST. In other news, NASA's Artemis mission failed to launch last Monday as one of the engines on the SLS rocket failed to cool down to the correct operating temperature before launch. There was an effort made before launch to fix the problem, but engineers were unable to be satisfied and the launch did not go ahead. The launch is now targeted for Saturday at 18.17 GMT and NASA say they will attempt to cool down the engines earlier before launch and that the problem was potentially caused by an inaccurate sensor. Hopefully all will go well and the launch can go ahead as was planned on Monday. And now over to Ben with his bit. Thanks Doug. Also in the news this last week has been the description of a new kind of large mosasaur from Morocco. Named Thalassotitan Aatrox, meaning cruel sea titan, this mosasaur was an apex predator of the time in which it lived, showing many adaptations to a hypercarnivorous lifestyle. A lot of material is known for this animal, with several almost complete skulls, vertebrae, ribs, limbs and other elements being described in the paper naming it. It's estimated to have reached a full length of between 9 and 10 metres, and comes from the very last stage of the Cretaceous period. It possesses a particularly broad skull with huge jaws, as well as teeth that resemble an orca's in shape. It also has a marked reduction in cranial kinesis, showing that the overall construction of the skull is far more robust, enabling it to bite more powerfully. Interestingly, some associated fossils, including other mosasaurs, a plesiosaur, a turtle, and fish, show what has been interpreted by the authors as acid damage, leading them to suggest that this might represent prey that had been fed on by Thalassotitan. This new species shows how the Mosasaurs managed to become apex predators and diversify right up until the end of the late Cretaceous, when they became extinct. They really are remarkable creatures. Also in the news is something that we should have covered last week, the naming and description of a new Ceratopsian dinosaur. Named Bisticeratops froseorum, it comes from late Cretaceous aged rocks in New Mexico, and is based on an almost complete skull. It's classified as a kind of chasmosaurine, and is distinguished from other chasmosaurines due to differences in the skull bones. It's found that it might actually represent a possible new group of southern chasmosaurines different from others already known, adding to our developing understanding of the diversity of these animals, as well as how they vary geographically at this time in the late Cretaceous. Finally, we have another amazing study that should have been included last week, the description of mummified Lystrosaurus specimens. This paper describes a variety of fossils all collected from one locality in the Karoo Basin of South Africa, which are interpreted as preserving evidence of periodic droughts resulting in mass die-offs of the tetrapod fauna living there. Many of these fossils include clusters of Lystrosaurus individuals that are all articulated, laying prone and spread-eagled thought by the researchers to show groups of these animals that collapsed and died here due to drought. The sedimentology of the area does indeed show that there was a shallow river channel here that must have dried up occasionally, so these animals were likely attracted here by the water source and then ended up dying once it disappeared. And as if that wasn't enough of an amazing discovery, two of these Lystrosaurus specimens actually preserve mineralized mummified skin, showing how they became quickly desiccated after they died. It's an absolutely fantastic discovery, showing just how hostile the early Triassic world was in the aftermath of the Great Dying. Back to Doug in the studio. Well, that's it for this week's 7 Days of Science. I do hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you on Sunday.